Christopher Knowlton. I am a PhD student at UIC in biomedical engineering and I'm also a movement artist, choreographer, and dancer in Chicago. The piece I did for Kuro Monkey was storytelling, like comedic storytelling. Um, it was about, um, it was specifically about just a particular experience where I um, sort of had to do this elective procedure of sperm banking, um, which is straightforward, it's pretty much what you think it is. Uh, but I had to do it because I had been diagnosed with cancer. Um, and so I had been diagnosed with testicular cancer. Um, I had the surgery and then I subsequently um, had to have a round of a couple rounds of uh, chemotherapy. So chemotherapy can make you temporary or in some cases permanently infertile as a man. Um, so they recommend that you, you bank your sperm. Um, it's kind of a complicated thing for a gay man <laughs> who um, doesn't necessarily plan on having a family in the future the near future, at least. It's pretty simple. Like, have you had surgery? Um, you know, when was your diagnosis? Uh, uh, have you been hospitalized before? Um, just you know, kind of basic hospital things. And then it's a really fun question where it's like, in the case of your death, who would you like to retain ownership of your sperm? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my parents, right? Maybe in the future they'll like have enough technology to create a new me and start all over again. Or it's like, oh, you know, what about one of my exes, right? Like, it'd be like a weird, morbid, beyond the grave joke. <laughs> so when I die, like, they get a package of sperm from an Amazon drone. I tell it is almost a standard routine um, because comedy is really my way of coping with that. And so it's sort of this self-deprecating comedy where I'm like, this is <laughs> just the silliest thing and I can't believe this is happening to me. It seems like uh, right out of a sitcom to me. Um, and so comedy was my way of, you know, I, I would tell this story at first and I found people, you know, laughing with me about it. And I realized even though like at the time I really did not enjoy this experience, um, it became a powerful way to say this is a really unique experience I had, and um, it l helps other people feel more comfortable um, when I talk about my situation of, of being diagnosed with cancer. Because that could be a very sensitive subject, and um, the comedy and sort of this like silly, over-the-top experience that I had gives people an access point to that. One of the really powerful moments I had <laughs> powerful um, was when I one of the first times I saw kind of like my best buddies um, from high school who they're all they're all like straight guys um, one of the first times I saw them after chemotherapy I think one of them made very direct just totally blunt joke just something to the effect of like so I hear you've only got one nut now and it's like that's hilarious. Like, there's something about that, that was so freeing. There was something about that that was so, like, helped me feel normal about it and helped me, help me laugh about it, you know? It was really heartwarming to them just kind of, to give me that, like, punch on the shoulder um, joke. And so, uh, in a way, it's better, I would say, to help that person feel normal, you know? help that person treat them like you would, um, and just rely that they'll let you know if, you, if, you're, if you're hurting them. But you know, don't walk on eggshells, don't treat them delicately, don't pity them, don't like, 
don't like, you know, like fluff their pillow and then like turn down their, like, just like help them be the person they were, you know, and, and, you know, joke with them. <laughs> So testicular cancer is very early onset compared to a lot of other cancers. So a lot of cancers that may be due to environmental factors, um, you know, such as just lung cancer due to smoking, tend to happen later in life. You know, people think about getting cancer when you're 50 or 60. Um, testicular cancer, the prime age for men is between, uh, depending on what you read, it's between 25 and 35. It's uh, very, <laughs> when you're very young, young is um, when it the majority of people are diagnosed, um, and it's mostly related to genetic predisposition. So there's not necessarily any environmental factor that they've um, linked to it. Um, and then you're most at risk if you're, like I said, this 25 to 35 year old white male is actually the most at risk population. Um, and yeah, you know, that's, that's sort of the facts around it. For all men, for all men, check yourself. Like, put your hands on your nuts and feel them. It's important. Learn, learn how to do it. It's the simplest thing. You're probably doing it anyway. <laughs> but just, just um, do it consciously um, and do it with intention. Just kind of on a semi-regular basis um, because self-detection is going to be your best protection. Um, if you do detect something, it's not necessarily cancer. <laughs> it could be an injury um, that will go away. It could be a, a benign cyst that will just persist. Um, but your doctor is the only one who can tell you that if it's one or the other um, or something else. So a lot of the times it's not cancer. Sometimes it's um, something that needs surgery but doesn't need chemotherapy. Um, and then sometimes you may have to go through the whole rigmarole. Um, but just know that this is one of the most treatable cancers um, as far as success rate. So you, you really have an advantage. So there's no reason that you, you know, the worst case scenario is when you don't detect it. And that's when it can really be um, difficult um, so yeah don't be don't be afraid of your body and just know that it's gonna be hard um, but it actually you know it'll, it'll help you figure some things out and eventually you'll get your hair back <laughs> got my hair back um, eventually you'll feel great um, I'm in better shape now than I was before uh, you know eventually you'll be able to um, get back to life. It may not be immediately. Um, and this, this can be for almost any sort of recovery for illness or disease. You may not be able to get back to your normal life immediately, but um, just be patient with yourself. My experience was that, especially because I had to go through the reproductive health care system, that was especially geared towards, that definitely had a hetero hetero slant to it um, just because it's based around reproduction um, and I think at least in in that field and in quite a few other fields there should be more there should be more understanding about queer needs and so I can speak from a from a queer male perspective um, for example, things like um, HPV vaccinations. Um, so HPV vaccinations are now developed, they're extremely effective. Um, they're being marketed to women, right? Um, uh, women, I think, like, I think teenage women, right? Um, great, that is like, that's awesome. At the same time, a lot of women are, one, contracting these HPV from their male partners, right? That's the route of the virus. So there's n as much of a need to vaccinate the men as there is the women. Um, and in the same way, the queer male community has, <laughs> that's not women, um, but they are also affected by HPV. 
And HPV is, you know, just it's the general general warts is generally how it um, is expressed. Um, but it's you know it's a human papilloma virus, um, and if you've seen some of the marketing around Chicago, like I have, um, HPV, human papilloma virus can lead to cervical cancer in women. In the same way, um, HPV in men, if it's contracted annually, can lead to colon cancer. Uh, so, and because it's the same, it's the same process. So, but that's the, that's not um, the focus of a lot of doctors. So, um, not that doctors should be invasive about um, someone's personal life, but I think that especially general practicing doctors and and their patients should learn to have a more open dialogue about um, what your needs are and uh, be able to, you know, tell those sorts of things to, um, you know, to queer men who are like me and because you know, I happen to know this <laughs> because I work in the medical field, but I think there's a lot of gay men that may not know. It's important to recognize diseases for what they are. So I, I even remember when I was little um, and I would get the flu and then I would, I would feel guilty about getting the flu. <laughs> and my mom's like, oh, that's called Catholic medicine. So that's where there's guilt around the feeling that you got sick, that somehow it's your fault that you got ill when really you're just, you're a social animal, you're a social being, and these viruses and these bacteria are transmitted through social interactions, you know, by shaking someone's hand, by, you know, breathing their airspace, by kissing someone, by, you know, sexual contact. Um, these are all simply social interactions that every human being does that is, you know, driven by our, our social nature. and the diseases take advantage of that, you know, that's, and that's how diseases are spread. You could follow all the rules and you could, you could still get sick with something. Um, and that's not your fault. So even if, even if you don't follow all the rules and you get sick with something, that's still not your fault. Like these things happen. You're not the only person that this has happened to. And, um, the most important thing is like, how can we, you know, help you, um, you know, if it's curable, how can we help you cure it? If it's treatable, how can we help you treat it? Um, if it's manageable, how do we help you manage it? You know, that really needs to be the productive conversation. And that's, that really is across the board for anyone, but especially for those groups who have already been marginalized by guilt or shame. Illness, injury, disease doesn't discriminate. Um, and so it's more important that you seek out the treatment that you feel isn't necessary and that you give your, you don't be afraid to seek out information, don't be afraid of your body. Um, and that there are people out there who will help make your life the best it can be, that, that will help you manage what you may see as an obstacle.